Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Actually, yeah, before I start this screen. Can everyone see the shared screen? Yep, we can. All right, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Gina. Um, I'm a teaching professor at CU CS department. Um, besides teaching, uh, I actually I teach uh, data science and machine learning subjects to undergrad and online uh, postback program. I'm also going to teach um, or develop courses for uh, masters of data science program. So that's what I do normally. And um, besides teaching, I also do research and my research interest is in deep learning applications. So we'll be talking about this. Uh, just briefly, I will go through what I've been doing in the past. So it was uh, many years ago, um, I got interested. So it was my first deep learning project um, I scraped the data from uh, internet, some YouTube and, and uh, various internet sources. I scraped a variety of animal sounds. Um, and then I did the processing using uh, Fourier transform and then um, multiple, multiple um, filters and then um, transform into some kind of image, which is called a male frequency. Um, Zepstra coefficients, which are the coefficients that talks about which frequency. Hello? Okay. So, anyone who's not Gina should mute themselves, please. Sorry, Gina. No worries. So yeah, this is an image that represents actually uh, the sound intensity and then the frequencies. So applying um, convolution neural network, I was able to do the classification on which animal sound it is. Um, it sounds very trivial for animals and humans to distinguish different sounds, but um, you know sometimes it's difficult to do that. So um, you know, deep learning is able to help and. Even though it was not image, um, I was curious how, how I can uh, change the format um, modality from one modality to another and apply the same technique. So that was, that was it. Um, another project I was working on was brain tumor segmentation, again, using deep neural network, um, convolution neural network. And if you are interested there, are, uh, nowadays there are so many um, so many uh, data sources like uh, this site hosts a lot of um, provides a lot of medical data image uh, medical image data. Um, some of them comes from medical image conferences or uh, medical conferences, um, and some of them comes from individual um, medical institutions, and they are uh, interesting. So you should check it out. One of them was called the brain tumor segmentation, and they've been running this challenge about a little less than 10 years. And uh, it's one of, the, one of the most popular and also interesting data sets. So I, I participated here a few years ago, um, and then I built some deep learning model that was to test the different ideas in the deep learning models and um, got some good results. But the reason why some of this data from medical industry is interesting is that it's a high impact. Um, for example, this brain tumor has five years or less of um, average survival rate. Uh, so it's a highly, um, dangerous type of tumor. So I was interested in uh, how this segmentation can help um, kind of showing, um, helping doctors to uh, plan their, their um, treatment plans. Okay, and then um, another interesting project I worked on um, 
was collaborating with the, some a big medical center in Korea. Uh, they were, um, they had a cardiology department and um, the doctor was using, um, the doctors were collecting data from uh, equipment called IBUS, which is a um, ultrasound imaging device that uh, for heart disease patients. So they put this device from the wrist or, or the leg and they travel this device all the way through to their heart and then take a bunch of images uh, to find where uh, blockage happens and uh, how severe those are. And then um, in order to do like surgery or, or even know whether this patient needs a surgery, something or, or a stent inside of their, their heart, heart artery, um, they have to do a bunch of other tests like measuring the pressure before and after this blockage. And it is invasive and the chemical they use to do imaging and measuring those pressures are sometimes um, causing some troubles for patients and uh, make some deaths. So um, the idea was to take only the ultrasound images, uh, not pressure, uh, pressure measuring, blood pressure measuring device. And can we predict the pressure pressure drop before and after this um, blockage uh, by just looking at the image. Uh, so we also um, developed some deep learning image. Um, it had a lot of data cleaning that I didn't realize. So I learned that the uh, real world data is very messy, but it was very uh, rewarding and fun project. So the doctors did manual segmentation with the imaging experts, and then uh, we built some automatic segmentation algorithm. And then we did some of these cycles to clean up some of the images. And then um, we extract some features from those images uh, and uh, run the machine learning models, various machine learning models to classify uh, whether this patient needs a surgery or not. And uh, previous, like, previously, before we apply this machine learning and deep learning techniques, the accuracy um, of the model they, they've been using was around 70% or lower. We were able to enhance this uh, using machine learning technique to over 80%. We run a lot of hyperparameter optimization. So hopefully, um, you know, the next phase of research can even make it higher. But anyway, that was um, uh, one of also a uh, useful application. I would say, uh, still, medical industry is a little slow to adapt. Um, however, there are active research going on um, in medical imaging domain. So there are a lot of opportunities. So that was uh, like I did personally. And then um, I joined the CEO two years ago. And then uh, these are the some of the projects that I uh, work with the master's students here. Uh, so I'm gonna just suggest this, uh, I'm gonna talk about these three projects briefly. Uh, bird sound generation given images. Um, and then uh, like we also try to improve the breath, uh, brain tumor segmentation project using uh, some technique called the curriculum learning. And then we also um, explored some possibilities using reinforcement learning in the navigation problem. So the first uh, project, uh, it was done by several students uh, in the multiple semesters. So the first group of uh, students, they collected, scraped the data from two sources. Um, like this, this website called the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has a, a lot of bird sound resources. Uh, so we scraped the data from there and we also download data from ImageNet, which is uh, tens of millions of images and what, what is nice about ImageNet was that the data structure was ontological. That means um, it has a lot of data, but also it has some categories uh, that are suitable for us. So we didn't need everything, but we uh, subselected the birds category. And then inside the birds, there are like different species of birds. Um, so we had to kind of um, search uh, what kind of birds in this you know, from this corner lab, 
was included in ImageNet. So we selected six um, birds breed and then um, the idea was to, given the image, can the network generate the bird sound? And there was like, there was no like big reason why we wanted to do that, but it was um, interesting, scientifically interesting that, you know, there is an association going on when, when uh, children learn about the image of animal and the sound of animal. So inside of our brain network, um, even though the data, data modality is different, we are able to make some association. So our question was, can neural network able to do that? Um, so we identified the six um, different birds and um, you know, clean the data. And uh, we build the models and we had the two different ideas. One of them was using um, sequential model, such as uh, like RNN or LSTM or um, some language models similar to language models that can generate uh, raw sound waves. And the other one was, can you generate the uh, spectrogram, which is another type of image, but it's uh, some representation of the sound. And then we can uh, have some conventional method to convert those spectrogram to um, raw sound wave. So yeah, we um, work on that and we, so we were able to successfully generate the bird sound, give them images. Um, so the, yeah, first one was uh, using this the sequential models. And then uh, the second one was using GAN. Uh, GAN is a generative adversarial network that uh, you might have heard about. Uh, what it essentially is, is uh, using adversarial training, giving, um, having some input in, and then it asks to learn um, whether the generated image out of it or of the original image, which one is uh, which one is fake and real. So by forcing um, learning those like representation of generated images or whether it matches the uh, real image or not, um, the network is a force to learn better than just a supervised learning. So yeah, we use those technique to generate the bird sound and uh, yeah, we were able to do that. So that was a, some fun project. Another project that we um, tried was applying curriculum learning on brain tumor segmentation. The so curriculum learning idea has been around, it's uh, more than a decade um, by a famous machine learning researcher, Yusha Benjo, um, what he did many years ago was that um, his team was trained, uh, tried to see if teaching the neural network in different uh, sequence. So when you train neural network, it's usually like randomly, randomly trained. Um, so when you show the data to the network, you have to kind of shuffle because, uh, you know, that way we are hoping the network is able to learn a uh, robust distribution. However, there is a, a, the opposite thought that how, how about teaching neural network in a way that a uh, human learns? So when you learn some concept, complex concept, um, you learn something simple first, you learn about the alphabet and then words and then sentence, right? So a similar idea, um, his team was exper uh, experimenting that um, having the network to learn uh, some simple geometry first and then uh, introduce more complex geometry later and then um, have the neural network learn staged manner. They also tried um, doing the same thing with the, uh, the word prediction in the language model and they um, show that with some careful training, um, using curriculum actually can uh, be more beneficial than uh, just a random training. 
So we wanted to apply this idea and then uh, we did some training randomly initially first and then identified which, um, which data, which data sub, subset of data are difficult and which uh, subset of data are easier. And then um, we tried to do the curriculum learning. However, we found that um, during the learning in different curriculums, uh, the network is, does not remember the first stage. Therefore, it was very hard to um, have a better result. And um, the project has not ended because um, it needs more optimization. So yeah, if anyone is interested, it could be the next project too. Another um, project a student did was that he was interested in uh, different uh, reinforcement learning models, how they um, perform in certain environment. So he used a 3D house simulator called the Habitat, and then um, which gives this, this a photo or video images and these depth images in real time. And, um, uh, it can, um, we can we can train it to navigate in a maze, which is a, some kind of house. Um, and then he used some uh, models that were um, that were uh, in in some other papers. And then uh, we we trained the different types of models, and one of them called a PPO model um, performed better than the other. So he did some kind of comparison study on this one. So that is one example. And any questions so far? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, yes. Thank you for conducting this question. Uh, initially, uh, in the bird sound, how many seconds of audio data did you take like for training? Uh, for so coronal one? One. The, the the sound sample uh, was very different. Uh, some of them were one second and some of them were a few tens of seconds. So we uh, normalized them to five seconds. We discarded something too short or we um, actually made them repeat it. Right? So we just normalized them by five seconds. Yeah, we I caught up. It. Yeah. Uh, I have an, another follow-up question. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was the negative sound in word classification? Negative sound would be, um, what do you mean, like in terms of like the first sound and not that first sound? Yeah, so for example, if it was a binary classification, then there would have been a single word and then uh, a sound of grass or sound of trees. But if it have been multi-class, then if you are classifying different words at the same time, then uh, yeah. It would have been like different sound A versus sound B, right? We had the six bird sound and the network was trained so that it correctly classified one uh, bird sound. So, um, so it does one versus the other. All right. Yeah, got it. And did you do spectrograms or the waves for training? Sorry. Did you use the spectrograms or the waves for training the neural network? Oh, so it depends on the uh, model. So when the sequential model, which predict directly the waveform, um, the waveform was used for, for the label. But the um, on the other hand, the GAN model, which uses a CNN, um, used the spectrograms. Yeah, good question. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, so which type of spectrogram? So uh, I have a similar project like this in my Google Summer of course. So I'm asking these uh -huh. questions. Uh, so where I, I had see. to classify, yeah, Southern resident kilowatts. So I had one more question. Uh, which type yeah. of spectrograms should you use? Like male spectrograms or PhD or which one? Yeah, and we use a male, male spectrogram, um, MFCC. And there was another one, a uh, log scale. Um, kind of forgot the real name, but it, it's something to do with the log. Okay, okay, got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, so yeah, those were some projects I've done and then uh, my students have done the past few years and um, 
Let me talk about current project that we are working on. The keyword I'm interested in is these two things. One is called deep unsupervised or semi-supervised learning, and the other one is called a graph neural network. Both of them are very uh, new concepts and actively researched the area. Uh, so this is some kind of top 50 keywords from uh, one of the most you know, popular ML conference called ICLR. And this year um, they announced this 50. And uh, when you see this, uh, you might have to be a little careful because um, why deep learning is, I mean, deep learning is obviously the top, but deep learning is a huge field that includes a lot of other things here. So um, that doesn't mean that, you know, this is a single most important thing, but inside of deep learning, there are so many other uh, keywords that you can look for uh, what is being uh, most researched on these days. Um, but as, as uh, for example, reinforcement learning is also a big field by itself. Uh, so um, let's just um, ignore those. And in terms of technique itself, graph neural networks and uh, like combined self-supervised and unsupervised learning, um, it's becoming uh, more interesting and growing field. So I uh, wanted to like delve more into those kind of topic. Okay. And speaking of unsupervised learning, uh, here's a motivation. I have seen this um, cake picture a lot uh, in machine learning, I don't know, talks or something like that. Um, when it comes to available data volume, um, pure reinforcement learning, which means that you have to gather like some uh, data, input data, and then the action data from your robots uh, can be very challenging. So amount of useful data in reinforcement learning is very rare. So uh, Lun Yakun, he's also very, um, you know, uh, important machine learning researcher and famous researcher. Uh, okay, he's at Facebook right now. Uh, he, had this analogy that you know reinforcement learning in, in terms of data volume uh, is cherry of the cake and uh, supervised learning is icing of the cake. But what the remaining, the, the biggest chunk in the cake is actually unsupervised learning. That means a lot of data uh, don't have labels. So therefore uh, here is an important message that um, we should be like researching more how to use um, how to use unsupervised method uh, to harness the data that they exist a lot uh, without the labels. So one of the notable example would be the um, medical data, a lot of medical images uh, or medical data, like doctor's diagnosis and those kind of things. Um, a lot of images exist, a lot of measurements exist. However, having um, doctors or image experts to annot um, annotate them is very expensive. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what uh, unsupervised learning became um, popular these days. Unsupervised learning focus like a few years ago, about five years ago was more generative method, which means um, they wanted to generate some uh, images that's more realistic, like this, um, you know, face images with the super resolution, or um, generate the image uh, using neural network or using, you know, GANs to um, make it more real. Or they also explored, uh, researchers also explored, can we um, change the color or change the style of um, some object? Uh, you, you might have seen uh, some, you know, GAN project that if you put some photos, then you will, uh, photo of the landscape, you will turn into like Monet's um, painting or something like that. Those um, were some research stream that was um, also falling into unsupervised learning, or, you know, GAN type of problem, generative model problem. Um, and you might ask why people do that or people were interested because 
researchers were interested in uh, how to make neural network learn better representation and um, you know by a belief that uh, if you can generate things well, then uh, that means the neural network understood that uh, representation of the images, for example. Nowadays, um, there are uh, like more diverse research topics in, on supervised learning. So one of the things that um, people are interested in these days is self-supervision. So instead of having labels, because um, there are so many data with labels and um, in, in many industry, it's expensive to get, you know, labels. So why, why not use this um, data? However, how do we do that? Um, there is way, like depending on the domain and then depending on the data um, or features or representation there, uh, you may be able to engineer some of the uh, different tasks, which, which are often called surrogate tasks. Um, that means you make the neural network to do different tasks other than classification or segmentation or um, the original things that you want it to do. But instead, maybe have the, um, have the you know, image uh, rotated and you know the angle already. So you have labels and these labels can be generated very cheaply because you know the angle already. And by doing that, um, by, uh, by making neural network to predict these angles, uh, neural network is forced to learn this representation better. So that's one of the idea how, how to utilize uh, some different engineering task. Um, Another idea would be like playing with the loss function, um, like maximize some inform uh, information, mutual information. It's a little mathematical, so I will skip, but um, those kind of studies also very useful to um, make the unsupervised learning technique um, more helpful uh, when the labels are limited. And contrastive approach, uh, we'll talk about it briefly later, uh, is one of them. So these uh, three different approaches in unsupervised learning are becoming more popular and useful. Okay, so I talked about this, uh, what is a surrogate task? Um, it is a cheaper way to generate um, labels and make the neural network could do something different, but um, in essence, neural network is learning, even though it's doing something else. Uh, using, you know, similar, using the same principle, uh, we want to improve brain tumor segmentation. Brain tumor um, MRI images, uh, their, their numbers are limited, although I like that they said because they're still um, more volume than the others, but still uh, less data compared to ImageNet. So the idea that we uh, picked on was something called the deep infomex. Uh, so mutual, um, it's a loss function that makes mutual information um, maximized. So the idea is actually um, when you have a, a picture and there is a jaguar in the picture, uh, you want to maybe have this global feature of jaguar and then the spotted feature from some part of jaguar. And you also have some other um, image, maybe dog, something like that. And then um, take some part of the dog's image and make the uh, neural network to say whether it's the two, two uh, local features are actually from the same image or not. So it is the same principle that making our neural network instead of uh, classifying dog or jaguar, um, making it to classify um, or, or say whether they are um, the same picture or not. So it's slightly different um, different task, but it helps it helps the neural network to learn like how, how to focus on these uh, details uh, instead of uh, making it to learn everything at once. Uh, we kind of 
uh, engineer this feature or, or task, uh, so the neural network can learn better representation. So using this um, same technique, we applied it to uh, brain tumor uh, images. And then here is our architecture, uh, selecting local feature and global features um, from the you know, part of the encoder network. And then um, it was part of this year's uh, competition. It's still going on, so it's not ended, but we just submitted paper uh, to the conference and waiting for the result. Uh, at the time of submission, we didn't have like strong evidence that uh, DIM or Deep Informax principle helped, but uh, we got some evidence that um, it, it is very likely to help because um, this upper part results are twice longer than the uh, lower part of results. So we were able to um, train like half of time less, but we're able to achieve similar results uh, from just a supervised learning alone. So yeah, that's that's our partial result here, and uh, this experiment is still going on. And um, two students that work with work work on this project. Uh, one of them is a master student. Um, he did an independent study for two semesters, and yeah, we just uh, um sent a poster presentation, recorded video to the conference. Um, so this is just started uh, another project called the concrete, concrete Strengths Prediction using Deep Unsupervised Learning. So we're gonna apply similar uh, principle using uh, Deep Unsupervised Learning. So we're gonna create some surrogate task um, and this data is also um, label is very expensive. So what is the motivation for this project? Uh, in, the con um, in the construction industry, they have to have a really strict, um, they have to have follow very strict uh, quality control protocol. So every batch of concrete uh, truck, when they went they to the site, they have to get a sample and then send the sample to the lab. And this lab will um, wait until this concrete sample hardens, and then they will use expensive destroy um, machine that compresses the that compresses the um, concrete and then destroys it. And by doing that, they can measure how strong this concrete is. And when the concrete batch in that truck already already used that concrete in in the building. Um, if they don't pass, one sample don't pass their test, they have to tear down um, the entire building that they use that concrete batch. So that's very expensive. It takes about a week or more to do the process. And when the qual quality control doesn't pass, they have to tear down the building. Um, so this problem was suggested by a civil engineering professor. And uh, she asked me if we can use deep learning. So maybe instead of uh, taking sample and taking to the lab and tear down if they don't pass, why don't we just take a smartphone photos on site um, of the surface and see if this um, concrete batch is good enough or not. It sounds very ambitious um, because of, uh, of this problem. Um, in the data science perspective, um, having, having data, like we have to have a lot of images, that's not a problem, but we'll also have to have whether this uh, concrete has failed or not. Uh, those kind of data is very expensive to get. Uh, it takes a long time to get. But also um, the scientific question in civil engineering also is important to solve. So let's say we take a smartphone images of the concrete and how are we gonna connect that to the strings? Is there really a scientific connection to that? And um, I've talked to many like civil engineering professors and they think there should be a connection, although it's not like super obvious, but um, 
with the domain experts point of view, there should be some connection. So uh, the motivation is that, uh, can you find that connection? And how do we do that when the data are sparse? So our proposed idea is that maybe we can use this uh, unsupervised learning technique um, and then engineer some surrogate task that can maybe alleviate this um, data sparse problem. So we have taken some of the images like this. Um, this is some like photo image of the surface of polished um, concrete. And we have I don't know, thousands of these images and we are still taking it. And uh, we have also other idea um, to measure concrete strength. So one is the compression test that I talked about that we destroy the concrete batch. Uh, the concrete sample, uh, which will be expensive, but also we're, we're going to measure before then. Uh, we're going to try to poke on the surface and then measure the uh, strength on the surface. So by having, and maybe, maybe we will also have uh, also different modalities of measurement. So by having these different modalities and um, one modality can get more labeled data more easily than the other. So for example, destroying the entire sample will be um, difficult. It will be less volume of data. However, this um, like surface strength measurement will be much easier and much larger volume. So we are hoping to connect this um, strength of the, the concrete um, between this different modality and having the neural network to um, predict the one that's uh, difficult to get um, by knowing this one uh, that's easier to get. So yeah, that's that's um, some new project that we started. So we need some new people there. Um, another idea that I just started thinking about is um, using graph neural network to solve some navigation problem. So why graph? Um, why doing machine learning with the graph is interesting because a lot of data are graph structured. So for example, uh, you can think about social network or um, like disease, uh, disease network. And our brain is a network and you know, knowledge graph in, in the uh, business intelligence, uh, citation network, a lot of things around us uh, are graphs. So just a brief introduction, what's a graph neural network? Graph neural network is type of a neural network um, that does a graph convolution, which is uh, in order to, in order to um, predict the value of this node, some, some value of this node, um, we use information from its neighbor and then the neighbors of neighbors neighbors of neighbors. And when we do this iteration, um, and this function can be uh, you know, some defined different functions. And if we calculate this over and over again, um, this is called the graph neural network. And um, it is very powerful to do some prediction task. For example, a prediction task of certain node or Maybe the edge didn't exist, but we know that these two are friends. So this is friend of this, and this one is friend of this node. So we think maybe these um, two people are also friends, something like that. We can do those kind of prediction tasks. So speaking of what um, prediction tasks that graph neural network can do, uh, one example would be recommendation system. So by having this graph structure of what is related to which and which uh, customer about which kind of product and how they are related, uh, we can also uh, recommend some of the products to uh, another customer uh, that we found that maybe uh, this customer is similar to this customer, for example. So product recommendation, um, or um, we can do the, molecular discovery. 
or drug discovery using graph neural network. So in this case, uh, the biomolecules are um, graphs and then uh, the neural network learns about this uh, you know, similarity and this dissimilarity between this molecule structure and they can uh, suggest like new graph structure that are likely to be similar ones. Also, graph neural network has been used in AlphaFold. Um, have anyone heard about AlphaFold? I think a lot of people know AlphaFold by now. Um, the protein folding problem, and it has been a like, very, very difficult problem and, and requires a lot of computing resources, lots of supercomputers and so on. Um, but graph neural network, uh, because of this, like using neighbors and graph structure, uh, utilizing those graph structure very efficiently. Um, it made some breakthrough in protein folding problems. And they are, you know, still very active research area in, in bio, biomedical area. So what do I want with, uh, what do I want to do with it? Um, we can apply graphs in any kind of like, um, problem that has a graph, you know, data, graph type of data. So for example, navigation problem uh, can be also, uh, can use also graph as a data. So in typical navigation, the robot navigates and then have to find some landmarks and um, like recognize some object and find some landmarks. And then sometimes like people have to give some waypoints and uh, you have to build a 3D map or 2D map, things like that. Or or the, you know, the building or, or the places the robot goes. And a lot of times the robot also has a lot of sensor system, like expensive lidars, ultrasound sensors and proximity sensor. Um, not only the also cameras, but a lot of sensors in the robotics and things can be expensive, um, both computationally and also economically. So um, like recent robotics uh, research, they um, also in self-driving car, people are interested to know whether we can navigate using only visual um, information. And it's, it, it has been known very difficult problem. Uh, a lot of approaches use uh, cameras and then they have to, uh, you know, make some, uh, you know, there could be the robot might be looking at this direction or that direction and uh, even though it's in the same location, it can, the scene can look very different. Um, so some of the sub problems that they have to solve is that um, the localization within this um, you know, special graph. So when the robot moves like around like this, um, they can have some you know, random, random uh, motions and then take a bunch of pictures and they have to know uh, like where they are, but by looking at like different um, different locations and different orientation, it's hard to tell. And one of the uh, like challenging and Im important or interesting problem is that um, how can I tell this and this is the same same location? And it's very similar to protein folding problem. Uh, so um, you can create this as a like one dimensional graph, but then we can also make some similarity measures um, between these different scenes and uh, do the edge prediction between this node and this node. In the 1D like pass node, it's going to be very far away, but um, using this uh, graph neural network, we will be able to um, more efficiently predict the edge that were not in the original graph of this past graph. So yeah, I, I'm hoping that uh, this can be an interesting applications as well. I have not started yet. So I think that's it. And if you have any questions, um, I think it's a good time to do.
Hi, ma'am. Um, I had a question. I had put it in the chat. It was basically uh, regarding the reinforcement learning project. Um, I did check on the left side of the screen. There was some information regarding the depth as well. Um, so I wanted to know how was that captured along with the 2D video? Oh, which project is this? How was the depth information captured along this video? Oh, it, it, it's a simulator. So they give depth uh, information. Okay. Yeah. So it's much easier to use a simulator in, in the reinforcement learning project, unfortunately, because uh, robots, <laughs> using robots are very costly. Okay. Yeah, and I had a follow up question regarding the brain tumor classification. Um, mm -hmm. I know that it's a medical image segmentation project. Uh, I have worked on HubMap, which uh, involves kidney uh, tumor detection as well, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, UNET models are generally the go to models in such scenarios, right? Because of the um, the, the general way in which the entire mo uh, architecture is modeled. So, have we looked at ways of ensembling all the different models that? Uh, your team has worked on and say, for example, the gold standard architectures that are currently there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, those models are based up on some modified version of a unit. So, uh, mm -hmm. okay. yeah, I worked on like many years ago, I worked on a uh, variant of unit and we used one of them. But there could be better, you know, models, but we, the focus was not to make the uh, model architecture of supervised learning well, but just to got it, got it. Yeah, apply the solve thing. the problem. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank, you. Thank you. Any other questions about like uh, you know it doesn't have to be the project itself, but like other general questions about um, independent study and so on. Uh, I have a question real yes. quick. Uh, for the deep unsupervised uh, learning, do you have kind of like a, uh, if we were interested in going into that mm -hmm. topic, a mm -hmm. general uh, direction that we might go to kind of research what specifically we would want to work on within that area of research? You mean like uh, learning about the, the general field? Um, yes. Oh, okay, yeah. I highly recommend uh, UC Berkeley's graduate course. Um, you can find it on YouTube. Um, what was the name? I kind of don't remember their course number, but um, it is a graduate course taught by uh, Peter Abil, Professor Peter Abil, and uh, it's called the Deep Unsupervised Learning. And there should be good material in their website and also uh, YouTube videos. Thank you. And, yeah. If you don't have a time to go through all this 16 week material, um, maybe look at their slides and they list um, good like iconic papers. By, by um, going over those papers, I think you will be able to catch up fast. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I have one uh, regarding independent study. So I, I'm particularly interested in applying deep learning to mm -hmm. um, time series data, uh, particularly survival analysis. And um, that seems to be out of the scope of, of all the projects you discussed. So is there any sort of support for um, pursuing that sort of interest? Uh, that, that's sort of a project different, very different from the kinds that, that, that you went over? Oh, so these are some of the ongoing projects. Uh, so Brett uh, and the Concrete ML, uh, Brett is only by me, but Concrete ML, uh, it involves other professors. So um, yeah, I have to do it. But other than that, uh, the robotics idea was just a new idea. So it doesn't have to be that one. But I think um, most of the cases, it's, it's going to be how well defined the problem is. And then uh, do you have access to the data? I think that would be a question for you. So if you have solid solid idea and a data source, um, I think that's um, also possible. Well, I mean, just for instance, in that example, let's say there's no professor who has deep expertise in, you know, survival analysis or something like that is 
is that a concern uh, that I might be pursuing something that doesn't have as much faculty expertise? So I, I would have to be a little bit more on my own in, in that regard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's true. If you are looking for a domain expert, uh, that's true. If you uh, domain by domain, I mean like if it's a medical data or it's I don't know what what kind of survival data it is, but. Yeah. Well, for my case, it's uh, it's basically a wide area sensor network. So I, I do have access to the data, but it's like a wide, mm -hmm. large um, commercial deployment of sensor data in in cooling environments. Um, but the data doesn't really matter. It's just the the application itself. It, it, it's because it's survival analysis. It's and it's working on time series data. I um, see. Yeah, I, I, I'm just concerned about. I'd like to have you know an advisor that could kind of steer me away from from you know problematic directions and steer me towards kind of more fruitful directions and yeah I, I think it depends on like what kind of advising you're looking for if it's a more like a deep learning techniques yeah it, absolutely is it's a, a more like sensor domain probably I won't be able to help but I know no, it's strictly in the deep learning domain because yeah. the the the, the application domain doesn't isn't really important it's just uh it's just at its core it's just um applying deep learning to uh survival analysis and and the fact that it's in a you know ref refrigerated environment isn't really important mm -hmm. uh speaking of sensor data uh, professor sang tae ha also he works on some sensor data and those ML, so you might want to check out him as well. Okay, great. Could you spell his name out in the chat? That would be sure. awesome. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, any other questions? I guess not. All right. Uh, I think we are on time. Well, I think there's one. Do you happen to have okay in the, in the chat? Do you happen to have any recommendations for professor because in animal applications or astronomical aeronautical fields? Oh, I don't know many people in you know aeronautical fields, but we have a really great program in um, aerospace engineering. A lot of them also do um, like. Autonomous, autonomous system. So I think with um, some faculty in their department, uh, you will be able to find good ML faculty as well. Yeah. Any final question? Yeah, I mean, can you leave me email then I can maybe find, I, I don't have it on top of my head now, but yeah, I can. Yeah, I mean, you can even look one, at the aerospace two. website, you know, they have listed yeah. the faculties there. So yeah, definitely you can check the department website. Right. I only know one person there, so <laughs> I don't know if it will be helpful, but yeah, I yeah, can. Try. There might be more and they have updated information on their website and go to research and faculty pages, mm, definitely you'll be able to locate someone there. All right, sounds great. And yeah, please let me know if you're interested in, um, or if you have any questions. So Gina, do you want to put your email there? Just oh yeah, sure, yeah. Interested in doing independent study in the research work. Right, gina.kim at you. Um, I think it's a usually a good idea when you reach out a semester earlier and discuss um, what you're interested in and, and if you uh, want to like study meanwhile before you join the independent study for necessary background I think uh, I can um, give some pointer to that so yeah please reach out to me and thank you very much everyone for joining and listening thank you thanks Gina yeah. for your time thank you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me thank you